the trial. Things you may be going through today. Take off and down as we have broken hearted people right here in the midst. Joseph Parker, famous preacher from the century ago, you know, used to say, Preach to the broken hearted. And there's one way to keep it. We turn your Bibles to John chapter 6, the loaves and the fishes. We've been talking about examining the seven sign miracles, seven miracles Jesus did in the book of John. In fact, John's gospel is organized around those seven miracles. Those signs illuminate and reflect exactly who Jesus is and, and, and why he was sent into the world. He's the Son of God. He is God in flesh. He's the Messiah. He's the King. That we might believe and have life in his name. And this story about the feeding of 5,000 people is a very familiar story. We've, we've heard it before. In fact, it's in all the Gospels. But read with me, if you would, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 6 of John. If you don't have your Bible, there's one should be there next to the hymn in front of you there. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, that were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was not. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii, two hundred and twenty worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make this men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise the fishes, as much as they were. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, and it will be lost. Therefore they gathered them up, filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barn loaves which remained, over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that would come into the world. Verse 15, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force, to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain, himself alone. May the Lord has blessing to this, his reading today, as we look at this wonderful miracle. The fourth miracle, the fourth of these of seven that John's gospel speaks of. And in fact, John weaves this fourth miracle into the account of all the other apostles who gave their, their gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and wove it right into them, were right merging into the sequence of events of those Gospels. Now, there are several time markers in the book of John. John's Gospel is not a through the whole life of Jesus or even his ministry, it's just those seven miracle signs. But through, this, through the Gospel of John, we have the markers of how long and where he was in his ministry because we have the word Passover repeated at least three times and possibly four. Three and a half years of ministry because the Passover only occurred once a year. So when every time it's mentioned, it means another year passed. Passover, first mentioned in chapter 2. That was the beginning of his ministry. That would be probably six months in because he had an early Judean ministry. And he was in Galilee and coming into Jerusalem. And he, at, that, at that point, he uh, went to the first Passover, which would be the beginning year. Okay, <laughs> The next one would probably come in the last chapter we looked at. The, the miracle of the healing of the man of the Bethesda. It doesn't say Passover, it says feast. That's why we assume probably it was a Passover. That would be the end of the first year and a half, last chapter. Here in chapter 6 and verse 4, we have this third, or at least second clear mention, third possible mention, of a Passover, which would put us right at the second year, two and a half years of ministry. This means the last Passover mentioned in chapter 12 is the Passover that happened at the crucifixion of Jesus, the final time. So at this point, it's the, the final year of Jesus' ministry. What does it have to do with anything? The fact that he had a tremendous miracle-working 
preaching, teaching, ministry in Galilee for a year and a half. John doesn't cover it. Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke do. They mention all these places that Jesus went to. And we determine from especially Luke's account, because it's very clear in the, the chronology of when things happen, that the great Galilee ministry lasted about a year and a half. So we're at the end of that great Galilee ministry. But the other accounts speak about tours or circuits that Jesus took when he was in Galilee. Now he came down to Jerusalem, we know, but the first one began in Matthew 4 and, and, and Luke 4 when he took his four fishermen, Andrew, Peter, James, and John, who were fishermen, who were his first disciples on that first tour. Now what we see about these tours of Galilee, which are not mentioned in this, in this book, is that it was a discipleship building type of thing, of building his disciples, teaching them what we call discipleship, which every Christian ought to be involved in, that is growing in Christ, becoming more useful in his hands. And the first one was, was primarily centered on taking the disciples with him. And in that first account, he did what we call the Sermon on the Mount, the healing at the, excuse me, the uh, uh, first sermon had to do with uh, choosing the twelve apostles, the Sermon on the Mount. But then there's a second circuit, which means he, he went around, and this began around uh, Luke chapter 8, where he went with the twelve. The first one he took them with, and the second says he went with them in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Teaching in parables. That's when he started doing the parables, these stories that related to teaching and, and understanding. And then it was during that second circuit that he was accused of being in league with Beelzebub or Satan. And then finally there's a third tour, which begun in Luke chapter 9, when he sent out the twelve. You see the process, the progress for these disciples? He first takes them with him on the first circuit. He, he, he goes with the twelve on the second circuit, going around Jet Galilee for probably six months or more. But the third circuit, he sends them out two by two, not with himself, but they went out. And when they finished that <coughs> in chapter 10 of Luke, they came back so excited that something wonderful had happened. They had been involved in miracles, working miracles, because Jesus gave them that authority to go forth to preach and teach and do miraculous things, works of healings and so forth. So it was after this return, when they came back thrilled with the results of what they had seen, now John weaves this into the account here. And we come to the miracle of feeding 5,000. And by the way, when they came back excited, I have a feeling they probably felt like, well, we need some more training. We really need more disciples. <laughs> we had some. You brought us to this point. Now, where do we move from here? In fact, from this point on, we find for this last year of ministry, before he went to the cross, he pours his life, not so much into the crowds, as we see here, but into the disciples, the twelve. He begins pouring his life into them, teaching them, and helping them to understand what they would be doing when he was gone. Now, they didn't understand that either, but we did, because we look back on it. But two prominent events happen right before we get to this account today. The first is what I just mentioned, the excitement of these disciples. They just came back from this preaching, teaching tour on their own, doing the discipleship, standing in the place of Christ, going all around Galilee, having wonderful results, you might say, and they came back, desiring more disciples. How can we more, be more useful to the Lord? But there's a second event that happened right before this as well. It's a very serious one. That was John the Baptist had just been beheaded. <coughs> The story of Luke tells us about him going and how Herod Antipas, remember we talked about Herod Antipas, was the fox, Jesus called him, corrupt guy. And he wanted to see and hear and see some of the miracles of Jesus. He wanted this, to meet this man Jesus because when he heard about him, he thought it must be John, the one he had beheaded. He must have come back and was resurrected. So this Jesus fellow must have been that John that he had killed. At least that was what he was thinking of. But when Jesus men heard the news about John being put to death, he went off by himself alone. He wanted some, some privacy. He wanted some seclusion to get alone and perhaps take his disciples with him and be alone and pray and get with the Lord because of the seriousness of John having been put to death. Well, they went to a place called Bethesda. Excuse me, Bethsaida, I should say. But his Bethsaida is not the one right on the Sea of Galilee. It's the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee, just a few miles inward. 
Bethsaida Julius, it's called. <laughs> In fact, that's where he went. And normally that would be a very secluded area. Folks didn't go that way, except at Passover. Because the Passover season, when folks from Galilee wanted to go down to Je or well, up to Jerusalem, but it's south for us, we say step down, they would cross the Jordan River, go through Bethsaida Julius, and then around the eastern side of the Jordan River down in that way, so they didn't have to go through Samaria. You know that story. They didn't want to deal with Samaritans. They didn't like them, and Samaritans didn't like them. So Bethsaida Julius wasn't secluded anymore. All these people were there. They all were coming through heading to the Passover, perhaps. But they also, in verse 2, wanted the healings that Jesus provided. They were looking forward to the miracles, healing of diseases, so they thought, well, let's go see this man that we hear can do this wonderful work while we're on our way. So the crowds began to gather. I want us to see in this account today four descriptive characteristics of this miracle feeding the 5,000 in the account as it unfolds before us today. The first is, it was an intentional miracle. <coughs> in other words, Jesus wanted this miracle to occur. He intended for this miracle to take place. Look at verses 5 and 6. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company or a multitude of people who had come to him, he said or he asked Philip, Whence or where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now this intentional miracle begins with a question. Jesus asked the question. Asked the Philip. Which is the question we ask ourselves too. Why did he ask Philip? Why would he initiate all this with a man named, this <coughs> disciple named Philip? When we look at Philip's life and his <coughs> types of times where he comes in contact with Jesus, he's always the, the uh, down-to-earth one. The practical disciple of Jesus. He's probably the one in charge of physical arrangements. When something needed to be put together or get together, they say, Well, Philip, you take care of it. He would <coughs> put all these things together and do it for Jesus. So Jesus asked the question, Where can we buy bread? So all these people, these 5,000 people, and actually when you add up the wives and children, it was probably more like 10,000. But at least 5,000 were men who were there in this great place. And they say, I haven't seen this place, but they say it's like an amphitheater type area. It's so large. And by the way, it's the only time in Scripture when Jesus asked advice of anyone. Did you know that? Only time he ever asked a question asking for advice from somebody else. But you know, it's interesting. He didn't want advice. He wasn't looking for advice. He asked the question, testing Philip and all the disciples, proving them, it says. He asked it because he knew what he would do, verse 6. He was just testing Philip and probably all the disciples in addition because he knew what he planned to do. He had it already arranged. He knew exactly what he had planned to do. What was that? He was going to feed 5,000 people. That's exactly what he was going to do. And again, 10,000, maybe even 15, if you add all the extra families who were probably there as well. But there's a second reason he was doing this, to feed the people, which would be a wonderful thing, because they needed the food. They were starving. They were hungry. They couldn't go any further. There was no place to eat. The second thing was allowing his 12 disciples, these apostles, to participate in the miracle. You see, we've been talking about discipleship. He's been doing that in the process up in Galilee, and now he's brought them out here, northern Galilee. And by the way, Herod Antipas was the tetrarch, the king, the sense of the king, but he wasn't technically the tetrarch of Galilee. He wanted to see miracles of Jesus. <coughs> and Jesus stepped out of his province over into to, uh, this northern, northeastern region, which was the province of Herod Philip. And consequently, he wasn't in the region where Herod Antipas could get a hold of anymore. So he was really protected there. But he wanted his participants of his, his disciples to see a miracle and them participating in it. Now this miracle is famous for y'all. We've all seen it. It's in all the accounts. But I believe it's, it, it, it's wonderful what it did for those people. They saw it and they were amazed. But it's more important what it did for the disciples. Because you see, they saw they had nothing to do with the miracle. It was all Jesus. 
Everything was his doing. And yet, they had everything to do. Because they distributed this miraculous food that was coming forth. It was them and it wasn't them. Jesus was using them in a marvelous way and they would see it firsthand. They would actually participate in the miracle. And by doing that, he was discipling and teaching them to see that their authority was his work, not, not theirs. Which I think we need to see our way as well. We think, well, it's all about us. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, it is in a way it's all about us because he's using you in some miracle-working things in others' lives. They can rejoice because you let Jesus have it all. And you really have nothing to do with it. It's all Him and His Holy Spirit working through you. And that's the paradox of the whole thing. It's God using us, instruments that were unworthy and, and sinful, and we don't never be worthy of that. And yet He chooses to do so through His apostles. That's why it was an intentional miracle. But secondly, it was an impossible miracle. <laughs> Look at verse 7. At least impossible from a human perspective. Philip answered, after that question, 200 penny worth, 200 denarii. A penny worth of a denarii was one day's work for common labor. It was like a penny, you know. In those days, that was money. If you did a work, day's work for a man, you went out and worked his field, you'd get a denarius. So 200 of those means about 200 days' works, which is a good sizable amount of money. For that day, and probably for this, if you figured out inflation and so forth, it's two-thirds of a year worth of salary for a common laborer. If you figure today a common laborer would probably make maybe 30, let's just say 30000 a year, that'd be about $20,000 today. That's a large amount of money. But Phil would look out across that crowd and said, 20 grand wouldn't even feed this bunch of people in today's standards. Say, a loaf of bread cost a dollar and a half today. <laughs> wouldn't feed that many people. 20 grand. He calculated the crowd. He estimated the food. And he realized it would cost too much. We couldn't do it. Obviously, they didn't have that kind of money. So it's impossible. <coughs> it's impossible. It's impossible to do. When we look at somebody like Philip, practical as he was, he's so much like the average church member today. In fact, probably most the average churches today. Many churches today. You see, they'll say, we can only do what we have resources to do with. If we can afford it, we'll do it. If we don't have it, we can't do it. Isn't that the principle? Many folks, many individuals work within churches as well. And we call it, it's kind of a zero-sum thing. You know, this much money is coming in, this much money, this is what it costs, no, we can't do it. And we call them wet blanket Christians. Put a wet blanket anytime something comes along. Uh, trusting their own abilities, their own capabilities, their own provisions. If they don't have it, they can't do it. I remember years ago, many years ago, a church up in Michigan I was a member of. And uh, <coughs> I went to a business conference one night. They were discussing about paving the parking lot. Now, the, the parking lot was fine, but it was gravel and weeds and grass were growing up in the gravel. And you'd pull in, and, you know, on a rainy day, it'd be kind of messy and you'd have to step around puddles and whatnot. I didn't mind because it was my church. I want to be there. They're discussing, should we pave the parking lot? A lot of folks, yes, that would be great. It'd be so much more convenient. You wouldn't have to get your feet wet. So you know, let's pave the parking lot. The treasurer, no offense, Matthew, but the treasurer <laughs> had the treasurer. Said, we can't do it. We don't have the money. And I, I left that. I think they decided not to at that time. Later they did, after years later, but not, not too much longer later. But I was thinking, if you just paid the parking lot, it would make it much more attractive for folks. And other folks might want to come and they park their car and then they come. And those people who are coming, who knew, knew they would arrive, might be giving in such a way that we would pay for it quickly. I mean, the Lord would provide. But it was really not us, it would be the Lord doing, providing, for what we need. So many folks and so many churches have never seen the concept of stepping out in faith, doing something they really can't do, trusting God to do it, knowing that if God will provide for it, if He's in it, it'll take, be taken care of. Hudson Taylor, that missionary in China years ago, used to say, 
God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. We need to realize whatever we do in stepping out in faith and we don't have the resources, then God will provide those resources. An impossible miracle. Yes, He can't do it. But just remember, the last three to six months, these fellows, including Philip, have been out in Galilee circuiting that area, touring that area, preaching, doing miracles, seeing the power of Christ in their lives. And they were tired, and now they're standing with Jesus and thinking, we just can't do it now. They'd seen the powerful works. They'd seen all that God had done. By the name of Jesus and in His authority, they should have said, sure, we can take care of this. But it's interesting, Philip doubted, and now we have another person, Andrew comes along, verse 8 and 9, and he brings a young boy with him who has some uh, barley loaves. By the way, barley loaves in those days were, were the, the, the bread of poor people, just the meager, most meager item. And that's all he had. Five loaves and two small fish. Probably, and we think, oh, yuck, who wants to eat raw fish? Probably they were smoked fish because they didn't have refrigeration in those days and to smoke a fish and get it ready with them, they could keep it a pretty long time. Or salted, they probably salted it as well. That would be their refrigeration. But whatever it was, the fish was probably prepared in some way. They said, well, what are these among so many? What, what's this little bit of food? And again, you see a doubt. You can't do it. It's impossible. It's not even reasonable to think about. What are these among so many? Looking out at the vast multitude and saying, it's impossible, just forget it. <laughs> it was an intentional miracle. Impossible miracle. Thirdly, it was an improbable miracle. That is, Jesus was making preparation for without even the possibility of happening. Look at verses 10 and 11. Jesus said, make the men sit down. There's much grass in the place. The men sat down, a number about 5,000. The other accounts of this in the book of Luke and so forth tell us that he seated these groups in, in, in uh, groups or companies of 50. In other words, there was an organization going on. Jesus completely organizes the event as if it would happen, but nobody thought it would. <laughs> but he sits the people down on the grass in companies, groups, as if they were getting ready to eat. As if they were preparing to organize for a meal. I have a problem with this. And then in verse 11 it says, he, look at the steps he did. He took the loaves, he gave thanks, he distributed to the disciples. Which means before he did that, he broke the loaves. Then he distributed to the disciples. The disciples then to the people who were seated, and then fish as much as they wanted. As much as they wanted. <coughs> now, looking at this verse 11, when exactly did the miracle occur? It's hard to pin it down. Just like the water turned to wine. Remember that one? The first miracle he did? When was it? What? It was served as wine, but it just had been water. When did the miracle happen? It was a creation miracle, but it suddenly, somewhere in there, it changed. But like the nobleman's son in the previous miracle, or the second one, they didn't see that happen either. He just said, go home, your son as well. It just happened. This miracle happened somewhere in the distribution. As Jesus passed it to the disciples, the disciples then to the people, the miracle of multiplication occurred. And notice in this miracle, there no, they didn't carry out huge trays. It wasn't already there for them. It was as they were giving it out, it kept multiplying, getting bigger and more and more until everyone had not just enough, but excess pieces. They didn't have huge trays, huge containers carrying this stuff around to all these people. They were just taking the broken pieces to the people. And those hungry ate them and were satisfied. Improbable? Absolutely. It wouldn't seem normal when you do that. But then finally, in verses 12 through 15, it is an incomparable miracle. A miracle of abundance. 
It was more than enough. The recipients had all they wanted in verse 12. When they were filled, they were, were, were full. You knew that feeling. He said, go gather up the extra. Go get the leftovers. <laughs> so nothing be lost. Wow. Go gather them up. And what was resulting from that in verse 13? They gathered up 12 baskets of fragments, leftovers, which had been left over. Twelve disciples who had just been involved with the miracle, passing out, distributing this food, and now they've each got a basket full, probably a pretty size basket, of leftovers. They could eat later. All these disciples were taken care of. Their, their needs were taken care of as a result of the abundance. <coughs> Not only were they impressed, the disciples, because of their receiving this, but the crowds. What was their response? It prompted even a greater reaction from the crowd. Look at verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle of Jesus, they said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Now, what were they thinking? Now they had asked this question, at least someone from Jerusalem had asked this question to John the Baptist, remember back in chapter 1? They said, are you the prophet? They said, no, no, I'm not the prophet. But they said, this is the prophet that's going to come into the world. Probably as they had that bread having been multiplied and they thought, and thinking biblically back to Moses and the manna in the wilderness, how God sent down this bread-like substance every day for the people and they were filled and provided for. They made them think about Moses. And think about Moses' promise for a prophet in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18, the promise that said, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, that is like Moses, from among this brethren. They will and put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command. So as they hear Jesus preaching and teaching, they say, well, this must be the prophet. He must be the one that God has predicted would come. Scripture was fulfilled that day, they thought. This is the one. This is the prophet. <coughs> but isn't it interesting, verse 15, Jesus heard their comments, perceived that they would come and take him by force. Jesus, isn't it interesting? He knew their hearts. He knew exactly the way their hearts were and what they wanted. They wanted to take him and they basically wanted a material kingdom, a material king. Because after all, if you've got Jesus, you've got somebody that's going to give you all the food you ever need. You've got bread and fish, and we've got Jesus. Now he's going to be our king, and, and he needs to be because he's the prophet. He's going to be a king. Let's make him ours. Let's hoist him up here and say, we have a king who's going to provide for us our material needs. And Jesus knew their hearts. And what he did, he withdrew again. Knowing they wanted to take him by force to grab him, say, You're ours, and make him king. You see, Jesus wanted to get alone, and he couldn't get alone, and he couldn't get away from them if, other than just departing. He did. He wanted rest, seclusion, find a mountain where he could find solitude. The very thing he probably started to do when he began this miracle. And he found that that was the place. But it's interesting, he knew what they wanted to do. Do you know that Jesus knows your heart and knows you inside and out, knows everything about you and what your intentions are? You see, he knew their motives. Now, you and I can't, you can't guess or even know someone's motives. We do that. We try to do that. <coughs> the reason he's doing that is so-and-so. Oh, he's doing that because he wants, we, we impugn people's motives because we don't even know if they are Jesus does. In fact, turn back to me. Keep your hand here in John 6 and turn back to chapter 2 of John's Gospel. The last verses of the chapter 23 and following. Now, when he was in Jerusalem in the Passover, <coughs> that's the Passover of the first one, on the feast day, they, many believed in his name. That's a good thing, right? Many believed in Jesus. They eh? saw that and heard about that miracle. Many were excited after their feeding in version chapter 6. And they saw the miracles which he did, and Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men. As excited as these people were, and as desirous to have Jesus be their king, 
Jesus knew their hearts, knew their motives. It says, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus knows you and me, knows exactly what our motives are, knows exactly what we're like. He knows everything about us. It truly was an incomparable miracle. It was just beyond explanation. But it wasn't something that you can say, now I'll take him from mine. Because he's going to meet my needs materially. Well, what are some practical lessons we should learn about these loaves and fishes today? I want to suggest five of them. Number one, it's a lesson in multiplication. Our small resources, no matter what they are, can be increased in his hand as he meets and exceeds our expectations. We don't even expect it. <laughs> you can't do it, right? <laughs> it's been said little as much when Jesus is in it. That's a great thing to remember. What little you may have, what little I may have, it's great, it's wonderful, it's abundant when Jesus is there. And usually he does it when we least expect it. We don't expect it to happen, and yet, as we're trusting him, walking with him, we'll see that lesson in multiplication in our lives. Secondly, it's a lesson in, in discipleship. Jesus was using these select followers, these twelve, these people who really weren't worthy of much of anything. And by the way, they're all from Galilee. None of them were from Judea. They were the fishermen, the poor folks. You, you would never have chosen your select group of people to win the world with these men, but they were used by him. And they saw the mighty power of God displayed through Jesus, and they had a vital part. They were right there with him. God still uses flawed people, flawed and imperfect men and women who work miracles of power, not by their own doing, but by Jesus. Discipleship. So third, a lesson of faith. As these disciples saw their own involvement in his distribution, their faith in the Master was increased and strengthened. When we walk with Christ and let him use us in small ways or perhaps great ways, we begin to see and increase our faith in him, not ourselves. As we look forward to evangelism, prayer, outreach, whatever we're doing, that faith in you, your faith is increased. Fourth, it's a lesson in provision. God is the source of all of our blessings. All of our provisions come from Him. And He may choose to use us in that type of thing. He may give us opportunities by His grace, but the starting place is the Lord. It's all Him. Strength for a day and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine and ten thousand five to decide I, that him of great is thy faithfulness. The money, it really all comes from him. He provides. And he'll meet your needs. And finally, it's a lesson in truth. You see, this multiplication of these bread and fish provides something later. We don't see it here, but later in the chapter. He defines the true bread from heaven. Because they've seen the bread that he produced through miracles. He says, I am the bread. I am the true bread from heaven. The bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. They were thinking material. They were thinking, man, we got it made with this food supply. And Jesus says, what you really need is the bread of life. You'll never thirst. You'll never hunger when you have him. But we've got to cling to him. And stay with him. As Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? He said, Who would you leave me? He said, Who, To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life, eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. <coughs> you see, Peter saw it. The disciples saw it. And it wasn't just the material stuff, it was what he does in your heart. How he changes you and me to know Christ better. You know, we sang a while ago about uh, God providing, God blessing, and how we, sometimes we are at the end of our road. And some of you may be. Your resources are depleted. You have no hope if Christ doesn't step in. You need His strength, His salvation. You need His sustenance. A sustenance of life, of provision. That's why it's never wrong to follow Christ. 
Now those folks had the wrong impression. They thought we'll make him king. Great miracle. But it really impacted those disciples. And it should impact us. Follow Jesus. Step out of faith and trust him. Be saved through Christ. Not your own works. Nothing in you is worthy of that. Your best deeds are only filthy rags in the sun. Trust in Christ. For what done. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Father, we thank you. For the miracle of the bread and the loaves, the loaves and the fish, such small amounts of things which would be impossible to do, <coughs> Jesus chose to use. And perhaps in our life, the things we have to offer are very insignificant, but Lord, in the hands of Christ, by the power of His Spirit, they can be multiplied and magnified and used in such a way that others can know that you change our life. And Lord, it's a change for the good. It's a change for a spiritual worship. Where we worship in spirit and truth. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the bread of life. You don't just provide it, but you really are our bread. Now help us, Lord, as we examine our own hearts and ask, <coughs> have we come to know Jesus as our Savior? Have we been changed? Has our life been turned around? Maybe we're just walking through and going through motions. Daily going, weekly going to church and going through all the motions of Christianity. Never fully being born anew, being born again. If that's your case, would you just in the quietness of your heart as you're praying, talk to the Lord right now. And say, Lord, I need a miracle in my life. I need power. I need something above and beyond myself. My own resources are not enough. So Lord, would you come into my heart and life? Would you help me to turn away from sin and that sinful lifestyle? Humble myself and come before the cross and say, Lord, your work is sufficient. I believe upon what you've done for me on the cross of Calvary. And I believe that you rose again from that dead. That you live right now and I actually live in my heart. Become my Savior. To bring me to your, yourself. If you prayed that prayer or one like it in your heart, Jesus has just answered that. He's responded. He's given you the gift, of, the precious gift of grace. You and I don't deserve it. But he's stamped his stamp upon you saying, you're my child, my faith. You've been forgiven. Now you receive all the rich blessings that he has and offers. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. And now, Lord, perhaps if we need to respond by stepping out in faith and saying, Lord, I am yours. I want this congregation, I want the world to I'm a follower of Jesus today and give him my life. Thank you, Lord. Help us to do that which we've done in our hearts. For in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Our invitation hymn is number 317, All We Trust. All We Trust in I'll meet you at the front if you need to respond. If you need to follow the one believers baptism, Step out and meet you right here. As we sing number 317. <laughs>